what the problem is. Um, our little boy stopped breathing. Breathing now? No, he's not. Okay, do you want to do CPR? Do you know how to do it? Um, hold on just a minute. Does she know how to do CPR, sir? Yes. How Okay, how old is the child? He's 13. Okay, does he have any kind of medical problems? Huh? Does he have any kind of medical problems? No. He does not? What was happening before he stopped breathing? No. No. Mm -hmm. Hey, come on, come on. Okay, where are y'all at, sir? Are y'all at the house? What was he doing when it, before this happened? Ma'am? Welcome back to the Family Ties Podcast. My name is Julia Avery, and this is my sister and co-host, Kelly Ritchie. Hi, guys. We're back again. How are you doing, Julie? I'm doing good. A little heavy because of the case since I spent more time, like, reading into it, just dreaming yeah. of it. Guys, what... You just heard at the top of the show was a the 911 call for the case that we are covering today. Um, Julia, would you tell us a little bit about what we're discussing today? Yeah, so today we are discussing the murder of Tyler Jean McMillan. He died at 13 years old after spending two nights tied to a tree during a really hot summer in North Carolina. He ended up dying of dehydration and a heat stroke as well as uh, other lesions on his body um this was as a result of disciplinary action from his father and stepmother so we'll get into that a little bit more but this um this all happened in june 2008 in macclesfield north carolina so um that's what we're going to be getting into today and in addition to that, I'm just going to top it with saying that there's not a ton of news out there other than just specifically um, around like 2008 and 2009. And after that, it seems like this has just completely fallen off the radar as they tend to do. So that um, and the case, <clears throat> the case files seem to have been sealed mm -hmm. or I'm just absolutely inept at finding court records. <laughs> Well, I mean, you Good tried, thing. I've tried, you know, it's, it's not easy sometimes. So for whatever and reason, I think the plea that they took ends up kind of would play into that. I'm not sure um, what your thoughts are on that, but I, what I need to do is learn more about how this, this stuff works so that I can better understand how to research it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we're trying, guys. We're trying to get all the information and make sure that we do our homework and that we dedicate enough time and energy to kind of give um, these children justice. And um, we're, we're taking some feedback some, from some of our viewers, and um, it's been requested that we wow. stick to the cases and we don't waste time on mindless chitter chatter. So, Julia, with that being said, let's dive right in. Okay. So um, I guess we'll go into some of the different people involved. Um, we'll start off with the victim, Tyler Jean McMillan. Um, so he was age 13 years old. He enjoyed reading, karate, professional wrestling, being outdoors, fishing, playing with his cousins. He was a Boy Scout. He was born and raised in Pitt County there in North Carolina. Um, he it seems like the family was very Christian based because he went through before he was homeschooled. He started at Greenville Christian Academy, um, Trinity Christian School, and he grew up attending the Jarvis Memorial United Methodist Church. And then at the time of his death, that is when he had been taken out of school and he was being homeschooled. Um, and, then, and apparently the state didn't know <laughs> about that either. Right. That's, so. uh, that's what I was going to chime in with. And, you know, as it is with so many of these cases, we're seeing that, you know, parents for whatever reason are able to take their children out of school without really doing all of the legal 
expectations, no matter how minimal those are, even the, the minimum regulations aren't being met. So, um, and it doesn't seem like even for states that do have some regulations, it, it doesn't appear as though to me that they have enough um, protection put in place for the children to follow up with people that have taken their kids out of school to homeschool without following those directions and Mm -hmm. they fall through the cracks because they don't have appropriate follow through to be like well why isn't this kid been showing up to school yeah or something like that to make this this kid's life more tragic um his mother um michelle mcmillan died of cancer um Mickey, she grew up in Charleston, Maryland, and in Wilmington, North Carolina, where she um, was a 1984 graduate of Laney High School. She seems super smart. She moved to Greenville, where she received two degrees from East Carolina University in 1988, a um, BA degree in broadcasting communications, and in 94, um, a BS in mathematics. So definitely smart. smart cookie, yeah. She was employed at WITN TV for several years and taught math at Wel- Welcome Middle School for 10 years prior to retiring due to disability in 2003. So I wonder if that's around the time she started to get sick. Um, that would make sense. Um, she was a member of Jarvis Memorial United Methodist Church where she was active in the children's ministry and in the contemporary service. But in addition to her work in the children's ministry, she was also a longtime volunteer for Children's Miracle Telethon. She was a delight to be around, always cheerful, and a great mother. Those who knew her well say she was loved and took great care of her family and co-workers. Mickey was a devoted wife uh, and mother, a loving daughter and sister, and then she's survived by her husband Bryce McMillan and sons Tyler, Jean McMillan, who died in 2008, and Ryan Wesley McMillan. Her grandfather, Francis E. Sasser, and grandmother, Mary C. Sasser, preceded her in death. Mickey died at her home at age 37. So, like, what year do you think that was that she died? Because I think, you know, it's definitely within, you know, Tyler's probably relatively, would have been in his relatively recent memory, I would think. He probably would have been around nine or 10 when that happened. I'm so thinking. she stopped teaching it or, you know, retired at 2003. It might not have been long after. Right. Since he died at 13 in 2008. Yeah. That's maybe it was like really tragic to have to witness that. Yeah. And I'm sure, like, I'm sure, you know, I mean, he was old enough to um, process trauma from that Mm -hmm. and remember her. You know how there's some kids who move on a little easier than some of their siblings who are older because they don't hold on to those memories at a certain age, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So, but he was at that age where he knew and he processed it. He felt it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so then there's his father, um, who was, um, the biggest instigator in this, uh, of uh, irresponsible for Tyler's death. Um, he went to Pitt community college between like 1988, 1991 at one point, I'm not sure. It seemed like it was an outdated LinkedIn post (laughs) that he at some point was a project manager for construction company in Greenville, North Carolina. And the only things that he had um, offense wise, criminal record wise before this were just like minor traffic incidents. So um, as far as like with the law, he was, he was a relatively good citizen before then. Um, Well, And then Sandra, who is the stepmother in this situation, um, she's partially responsible for the death of Tyler. Um, She has currently, it seems that she's moved to Florida uh, and she started work at Wilburn Real Estate Incorporated um, in March of 2019, which is very recent. So she um, doesn't seem to have any prior offenses, but it seems as if, you know, she's doing just fine. And that's, and that's if my research panned out 
I hope that's not a weird hit off of another Sandra McMillan. <laughs> but it oh, seems just... like, hmm. I know According she was to out what of... we can find, if we're wrong, somebody please step in and be like, yo, you talking about the wrong Sandra. I know I'll be, I'll be fine with owning up to that. You know, I'm not a journalist. I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm trying. But we're trying to be sleuths as much as possible. And, you know, yeah. you, you seem to have done your research well, Julia. So thank you. you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, the other people involved were, or not involved, were the neighbors. Um, they never reported anything. They never noticed any signs of abuse going on. Um, they At one point, they had said they... Um, that the McMillan family kind of kept to themselves. So, and we did an aerial view. We can show you the picture of their house and kind of see where the neighbors are located to see if like, did anybody have an eye view of this going on? Did anyone hear anything? And it seems like they're in farm country <laughs> and they're very spaced out. Like if I were the neighbors, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have seen anything going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't really hold them responsible in this case because, you know, sometimes we have cases where the neighbors were right next door. They could hear things. Yeah. And they ignored it. Um, but in this case, I think that the neighbors, you know, are fine. Yeah. I wouldn't consider them complicit in this no. without more information, you know. Right. Um, Right. June Sasser is uh, the step grandmother to the victim. So the stepmother, this is her mom. Um, she appears to be actively commenting on his and his mother's page on findagrave.com. She's kind of seems to grieve this, um, this passing uh, of Tyler. And, you know, she seems to kind of, you know, she seems to be their champion. Um, yeah. She keeps their lights torched for them. Um, she remembers them, actively remembers them. And <clears throat> that's what I noticed first and stuff like this is who, who's, who's carrying the torch, who did this impact the most. Yeah. And, um, it seems this is a case with her and it is just, it's an insight both to her and them, the kind of people they are and were and the connection they had which is what we also want to focus on because the whole point of this is to, you know, honor them and to try to find justice out of all of this at yeah. some point. So to find this connection is what hits me the hardest because they've lost, they've lost um, a lot. They've lost to somebody. And in her case, many people very close to her. Keep going, Julia. I'm going to let my dog goes in. Okay. Um, so her most recent posts are uh, on Tyler's page. Um, they span from, let's see here, they span from February 2020 up until November of 2020. She even had stuff going farther and farther back, but I thought we'd keep to some of the most recent ones. Yeah. Um, so her first one, from 2020 is in February. She said, I saw a picture of your murderous accomplice on Facebook today. Made me so very sad. He's out there living his life and you are gone from us for forever. Life is so not fair sometimes. I miss you and love you so much. Hugs and kisses to you. Wow. Um, her next one in June of 2020. Um, you would be so proud of your baby bro. He got all A's his last semester at UNCW. We all miss you so much. Today marks four years since granddaddy came to be with you and your mom. Give him an extra special hug today. We miss him, you and your mom. XOXOXO. And then another one in June. Hard to believe you've been gone for 12 years. So much has happened since then, but not a day has gone by that I haven't thought about you. Miss you so very much. Hugs for you. Your mom and granddaddy love you so very much. Um, I'll read this last one for Tyler and Kelly. You can read the ones that she left on his mom's page. Um, 
So our last one for Tyler, our most recent one is happy birthday, Tyler. Hard to believe you'd be 26 today. Your baby bro is on his way to Utah to start a six month job at Tracy Aviary. He's all grown up. I think about you every day. Hugs to you, your mom, granddaddy, and mom, mom, and pop, pop. Miss you. Oh, um, I don't know what the other, um, other ones you're talking about are, but there's, there's one at the bottom. Ah, every oh time. yeah. Um, this one's really sad. She's just saying that every time I think 2020 can't suck any worse, it does. Alex Trebek of Jeopardy died of pancreatic cancer today. He fought the good fight like you did, but also like you, he lost his battle. Cancer sucks. Love and miss you. And she was saying that, you know, to um, Tyler's mom who died of cancer. So that was really sweet. Yeah. One thing that um, pre-incident wise that um, I I want us to really hammer home today is that um, for whatever reason, um, I'm sure in this case, religion had something to do with it, religion or economics. Those tend to be the two things that go into play here, but he was removed from school to be homeschooled, um, but they never submitted um, to the the state that they were intending to homeschool. So he was never registered with the state um, as being schooled at home. Um, so I think when parents tend to do that, that means there's something to hide. Um, and you can say that that's probably dramatic, but from our experience and our research, we're coming to see that that's actually a, a huge, huge red flag in yeah. um, spotting. For anyone case. who wants to say that, just so you know, the number of fatalities and abuse victims beg to differ. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, those four to seven kids every day who are dying, you know, in circumstances like this would, would beg to differ with you. But and that's not exaggeration. That That's data. That's facts. But so. um, let's get into the incident itself, Julia. Um, you know, we, we've already established that he was tied to a tree um, at his house for 18 hours before he died of heat dehydration and a heat stroke. But, um, you know, let's let's dig in a little bit further. I mean, it's already traumatic and terrible, but, um, you know, if if people want to kind of dismiss this as like, oh, well, these parents are just overreacting. No, this was pretty a pretty deliberate move. And Julia, why, why would that appear to be the case? Well, um, his wrists and ankles were bound with plastic wrap and he was also tied to a tree with another material. It seemed like plastic ties were used on his wrists. Oh. Um, and there is rope in one of the pictures dangling from the tree. It looks kind of like I don't know. I don't know if it was just thrown up on a branch, but it just, it looks suspicious. It looks suspicious. But so he was tied to a tree, couldn't move. Um, and according to the autopsy report, he ended up having a body temperature of 105.6 degrees Fahrenheit when he was taken to the hospital. That's, that's high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, tests after his death also showed a pattern of dehydration. Uh, he also had insect bites over his arms and legs and marks on his wrists and ankles that were consistent with the plastic ties, which is not accidental, not an overreaction. Mm -hmm. um, he also had bruises on his buttocks and legs that appeared to have been caused by a rod like instrument, AKA beating. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, he also a... had skin that was missing from his buttocks from being rubbed on the ground being from on where the he tree was yeah on the tree and so yeah, was he tied up in a standing position or a sitting position that i didn't get a clear picture on no the autopsy report was sealed okay um so that's i'm all gonna guess got. he was standing um but then again because uh... that's i mean I can see that I can see that him being tied standing and then that be the extra punishment. You've got to stand here and then him try to get loose or get comfortable in his, you know, rubbing up against the tree. That's where he gets the skin rubbed raw. I can mm -hmm. see that. Yeah. I can see to me if, if, if he has skin missing from his buttocks, I feel like, I don't know. That's just my, my opinion. Yeah. Um, so anyways, the, the plastic wrap, I'm like, is that saran wrap or is that like, I don't know. 
Um, it was also tied to the tree with some other material, and Bryce McMillan told the Edgecombe County deputies that he tied his son to a tree at their house because the boy was being disobedient and other disciplinary actions had failed. Well, you know, let me just first of all say, I don't care how badly your child is behaving. It never gives you any kind of um, excuse to tie that kid to a tree for two days, even, even a couple hours. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you know, no. we, there, there are other ways to discipline. That crosses if, a line. Yeah. It, that's, that's abuse. And if that's what you're going to, you know, as your punishment, how else are you punishing? What other beatings are you doing? But he said he untied Tyler Wednesday morning, allowed him back in the house, but tied him for a second time that night when the boy started misbehaving again. So apparently that's very iffy. That yeah, timeline and that confirmation, I I highly doubt that motherfucker untied him. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of him to I, have died. I think I think he had to have been out there. That, that dehydration hours. Yeah, that dehydration that they're talking about. I think, you know, um I don't think that that would just necessarily happen overnight, especially when no. we're talking about the degrees, you know, that the the temperature being over 90 plus um i mean that seems ripe for um and i don't know like if you tie your kid once and and they're back in the house uh, do you, if it didn't work the first time do you why would you do it again yeah and i doubt the hydration would have happened because if he came back in the house he would have had, had an opportunity to have some water or something i'm just thinking of how unplausible that excuse is i also would like to know yeah i don't either i'd also like to know how like um you know if they gagged this kid or if the kid's screaming would that be something that would raise the alarm with the neighbors i would say that that would be something that i would question on you know yeah, in regards the neighbors to, could have heard that for sure yeah, that's where i, I kind of get a little doubtful and looking at that picture you know i was kind of comparing it before i even saw the picture to our house and how in hodgenville and how far off of the road it was that long driveway trees everywhere we had two neighbors one kind of um so you couldn't see them <laughs> you couldn't actually see from the their house. houses from our house but you could see right. bits and pieces of of their property um it was very very secluded um but i guarantee you the the distance seems about the same from um their house to the near that neighbor down the road as it does from mm -hmm. us to mr cecil and if one of us had been tied to a tree and had been screaming just nonstop, then i, I guarantee you we would have heard it guarantee it yeah yeah <clears throat> so. absolutely so that that's a good point. I'm wondering if he was also gagged. Yeah. Um, I mean, ugh, you're you're talking about that that mean, heat and and that's pure speculation. Yeah. Just because there, the, those details were not available, um, but it's very convincing mm -hmm. speculation. He, according to Bryce and Sandra, Tyler remained tied up until Sandra found him unconscious at about 4.30 p.m. Um, he was taken to Heritage Hospital where doctors pronounced him dead. I'm just thinking about this whole chain of events because if you think about it, the tree that they tied him to is going to be visible from somewhere in their house. And you know, what was going through their minds? Because I guarantee you, they saw the, this process happen. It wasn't just a surprise. Like they he knew- probably was passed out, sweating profusely. I mean, there were probably visible signs. He was probably flushed. I mean, any parent could have seen the reaction and should have mm -hmm. realized there was reason for concern because dehydration doesn't just creep up on you. No. Um, and it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, when you're sick, and um you're suffering from that so they knew they saw yeah. it happening yeah i agree um so a lot of this is it's so difficult because they've kept the records to this case so tightly monitored but and if um, somebody else has been able to find these and have access to them and read them and know the details please <laughs> 
um, please contact us and tell me how you did that. <laughs> and maybe you're a friend of the family. Uh, maybe you're a friend of some, or new or an acquaintance or a fellow church member. Um, we, we would love to hear like your, your thoughts and stuff that you may or may not have thought about or, um, yeah, cause I, we don't want to be talking about pure speculation. Like I tried to find stuff on this that were facts. Um, yeah. but a lot of it is, is basically, it is a lot of speculation because they're saying it was unclear from the arrest warrant, whether the 18 hours of the boys spent tied up were consecutive or the total time spanning the two days, um, authorities mm -hmm could not comment on the matter. So I think they're having to kind of at this time take, you know, because they, they don't know. And they're going by the story that these two people are providing. So I think, you know, that's tough, but a rope that hard evidence by the tree though is pretty incriminating. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, one other thing I would be curious about that all these things that, um, you know, we, we can't find out about it, but I question like, okay, so, you know, what he arrived at the hospital and was pronounced dead. So he was clearly probably, um, safe to say dead before he, you know, he wasn't breathing Good when luck. they, when they were, you know, at four 30. Um, so it would stand to reason like, okay, so if, if the autopsy report, does it show that like lividity had set in? I don't remember how long it takes lividity to set in, but if your hands are, are and your arms are bound so tightly and the blood starts to pool, I don't know if that's something that would be mentioned in that the for them to be able not. to like place a timeline. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. I I'm interested in to know that too, because I wonder how long he was um, not breathing for before she even found him. Yeah, I'm always doing the yo-yo with my dogs. They want, in, <laughs> they want out. They went in again. They want out again. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> I get up a lot. You just keep going without me. I'll get back up. Right now they're out, which means in about two minutes, they'll want back in. Want back so let's in. hurry yeah. and get to the next point. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, we listened to that 911 call and I... Uh, it was noticeable that that uh, that gap in response, that just non-response when the dispatcher was asking them several times, several different times what Tyler was doing before he had stopped breathing and they couldn't answer. They would implicate themselves on this 911 call. They remained silent and it seemed like they were very in and out. It wasn't even clear if she was doing CPR, you know? You couldn't really tell over the phone what was happening. They were in, they were out. They yeah. handed the phone off to each other. They wouldn't confirm if, if they were doing CPR, they wouldn't confirm what he was doing beforehand. It was just very sketchy. And very one thing to also is, is also more pure conjecture is, uh, you know, in that time frame where there's so much silence, we, we, we listen to it ourselves. Like, so is it where, um, in that time frame, they are, they get rid of some evidence that really makes it pretty obvious that he was They're tied trying to, to get for two get days, him like, untied, get him yeah. untied, move the body, try to make it seem like this was something else that happened. I mean, was it longer than two days? That's another question. So yeah. I, I, I don't know without those court documents, it's so difficult not to just create a story in your head. So yeah. getting back yeah. to the facts, <laughs> um, after his death, Tyler was buried next to his mother who died of cancer um, and remembered by family and friends as a boy who enjoyed all of those things that we mentioned at the top, you know, the reading, the karate. Um, so his family have grieved him pretty, pretty deeply. Um, Bryce and Sandra were both charged with murder and felony child abuse. Um, I don't uh, during this... the first trial during the first trial the reporters had said and we've got an image of him crying they said mm -hmm. that the father Bryce McMillan uh, wept during most of the brief proceeding um, him and his wife Sandra 
sat next to each other like inches apart, but didn't appear to acknowledge each other during the entire proceedings. And this is based on the reporter's account. Um, they had separate attorneys. Um, that he was weeping, but I, you know, you're probably weeping from guilt, sir. <laughs> it's uh mm. is it a I got caught poor me, or is it a I really, really messed up and uh this is changing my life forever. I'm not gonna even it's conjecture to about that. I yeah, don't know the man. You can't know. Don't know the yeah. man, um, but we know his actions. So uh, a seven and a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old who lived in the McMillan house were placed in the custody of the Department of Social Services. Um, you know how I feel about social services, Julie. I don't know if that's a much better place for them. But no. according to an obituary in the Daily Reflector of well, Greenville. Well, hey, at least they were involved somewhat in this one. Yeah, I mean. I mean, they I tried. Guess- after he died, they tried. Um, and Tyler yeah, had yeah. one brother. Um, so, Julie, is this where it says Bryce and Sandra are both scheduled to be back in court July 2nd for a probable cause hearing? Would that be? That would have been 2009? No, that would have been 2008. But I didn't see anything. Um, Late 2008, I think. So they it's- had their brief. They had the brief, the briefing in uh, June, and then they were supposed to come back for the probable cause hearing. And then the next, the next big chunks of information I could find were from the next year, from so, January two thousand nine. Tell us about Sandra here, because uh, something I found ties in really well with it. So. They were, Bryce and Sandra were scheduled to appear in court again on January 13, 2009. On March 10, 2009, Sandra was released after posting bail on a $200,000 secured bond, which had been set by Judge Milton Fitch Jr. of the North Carolina Superior Court. The bond requires Sandra to live with her cousin and Carrie and wear an electronic monitor at all times. Sandra is now allowed to leave the state and would be giving, um, limited visits with her eight-year-old daughter who lives with her grandparents and will be called as a witness at Sandra's trial. Sandra is allowed to leave her residence only for attorney visits. So I found, I found uh, this letter, uh, this kind of template of a letter that was uh, circulating in response to, to her being released. And um, they were, there were two different addresses that were provided by this group Um, And they were just urging people to kind of pick a template and send, you know, their requests into these people. But this one in particular is uh, for uh, Dear Mr. Boney. Um, They said, uh, last summer, I was one of millions of Americans who heard about the murder of Tyler McMillan on the news. Since then, his story has haunted me. And I often remember the cruel torture the sweet boy endured before he died. Any parent or step parent who can commit such a crime is beyond comprehension. Something has to change. If we don't ensure that Tyler gets justice, we are just as guilty as those who ignored his cries for help. And when they say cries for help, are they maybe indicating that he was? There were cries for help? Um, Yeah. So that's something to think about. Now, what? what, hmm? There was there was something else. Um, Hold on. There was something else about her. God. I'll pick back up in a minute. I'm, I think it's down here. Okay, somewhere find else. it. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so they're just saying, uh, now one of Tyler's killers has been released on bond, free to have contact with children, including her own daughter, who could be called to testify against her. How can a child who has feared for her life find the strength to stand up and testify against a dangerous parent who has been set free after committing such a crime? We as a society are failing on every level to protect our children and act justly. Mr. Boney, you yourself have said, as your district attorney, I have promoted the rights of victims for more than 26 years. Child abuse is a crime in which all of society becomes its victim. Our children are our hope and our future. Those are wonderful words, but if you fail to prevent Tyler's killer from manipulating the system, those words are meaningless. Please appeal for an immediate restraining order to prevent Sandra McMillan from any form of contact with her daughter. I am one of many, many people who want justice for Tyler, but justice doesn't happen on its own. We must ensure it. Please do the right thing. The world is watching. 
Um, Not only that, but it's like, you know, ah. that it was incriminated that there were cries for help. Um, you know, you mentioned cries for help, like that the neighbors could have heard, but I'm thinking maybe like cries for help leading up to this incident. Could be. Um, like, I mean, cause this kind of stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. No, you know? it really doesn't. You don't go from being the, uh, like a great parent to suddenly just, I mean, there are mental breaks, but this seems like, you know, they used a rod like instrument to beat him. You don't go from great parent or doing the right thing to suddenly beating your child and tying him to a tree. There's development. There is progress there. Like, and I'm sure people knew, had to have known. Yes. Um, so. I, I'm i going to, there's uh, quite a bit more that I found um, from, uh, da, 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 da. I think it was the grandma. Um, she, actually, Julie, I think you've, um, you've also got this in your records, um, just saying that. She rarely saw her grandson after the wedding and claimed that Sandra McMillan threw out all reminders of the boy's mother. So actually, this is um, this is not Sandra's mother. This is um, the grandmother grandmother. Did you see any of her her statements? I included I included those statements during the outcome. OK, um, so we've yeah. got another another point um, for January of 2009 for Sandra. Okay. Um, she, Sandra had entered a plea to, plea of not guilty during her appearance in court in January of 2009. Bryce also pleaded not guilty to charges against him. He's being held without bail. The district attorney's office stated that they will not seek the death penalty against Sandra, though they have not said if they will seek it against Bryce. A tentative date had been set for a trial for Sandra for July of 2009 so then in june we progress to the next set of court dates and decisions um and julie not to uh ah. ooh, we have seven minutes ah. remaining on our timer but i do i like all of the the points um and the research that you've done um for like new the north carolina um like laws and stuff like that. So I do think this is going to be something that we need to extend into a separate episode to discuss. Okay. So let's finalize like where, this where case. we have gone up to as far as like the court. <clears throat> okay. So um, the father of a 13 year old boy who had died after being tied to a tree, he, uh, so the father Bryce, he pleaded guilty to second degree murder um, during a pretrial hearing, he entered into an Alfred plea in exchange for testifying against his wife, Sandra, who was charged with murder and felony child abuse. Sandra McMillan um, is out on out of jail on bond, and her trial is slated to begin in July. So that's where we left off with her. Um, and Bryce is to be sentenced after her trial. So then in the Alfred plea, a, de a defendant pleads guilty while maintaining his or her innocence. That's just a strange concept to me. <laughs> I'm guilty, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they do this and they admit it. And it, um, so it's in their best interest to take a plea deal because prosecutors have sufficient evidence that could find him or her guilty. So, which probably means they're guilty. <laughs> Yeah, but and the so the Alfred plea is what both of them used because the prosecutors had evidence and it was in their best interest to say that they were guilty, but they still wanted to say that they weren't. That's just so, gross. It's so, it's so gross. weird. To me. This blows my mind, though, that um, Bryce was sentenced to only 10 to 13 years. While Sandra was sentenced to only 13 to 16 years. Why is she, well, first off, why is she charged with more, possibly more? I'm wondering what evidence they had that <sighs> against her to have gotten her more, more of a sentence. It's gross. It's just yeah. gross. And I'm wondering if they got out early on good behavior or something based on the, um, based on the Florida move information i'd found yeah i'm wondering what happened there 
again, there wasn't information to find on my part. Well, you know, of course, Bryce and Sandra, they, you know, do their, did their whole crying in court thing. And so they never meant for Tyler to die. Um, but yes, but I, his grandmother, his grandmother was yeah. calling out bullshit. Yes. I love it. She said, I think he's a sorry excuse for a man. And I think he's a sorry excuse for a father. She was not happy about the sentences saying that uh, Bernie Madoff was sentenced to far more for some financial stuff. He was in, he gets 150 years, two people kill a child in a God awful way. They get 10 years. June said that she rarely got to see her grandsons after Bryce married Sandra and that Sandra had thrown away any reminders of their mother. And Bryce had called her from jail to tell her about Tyler's death in a very flat, dead monotone voice. He said, Tyler's dead and I've been arrested for first degree murder and I'm in jail. So when Bryce had pleaded guilty, she had started a petition and wrote to the district attorney's office asking that they not offer a deal to Sandra. It was said in court that the prosecutors offered the couple a deal because it was believed they did not mean to kill Tyler. What did they think was going to happen? She said, maybe they weren't trying to kill him, but they sure were trying to hurt him. He was just one of the most sweetest and loving young men I've ever seen. And then finally, the outcome that we'll close us out with is that, um, and then we'll, we'll pick up in our next episode of, of uh, the implications of all this. Um, but the cases and arrest warrants, they appear to have been sealed, like Julia mentioned earlier. Um, Bryce McMillan, he's been released, so he's free. Bryce pleaded guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to um, a very slim 10 to 13 years in prison. Um, Sandra also entered a plea of second degree murder and was sentenced to 13 to 16 years in prison and has not admitted to guilt, but has stated that she took the deal because of the evidence the prosecutor had on her. Oh, that's a that's what I was saying. That's what I was saying. I knew it was I there. Mean, but I was like, wait, 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 wait. So she, <laughs> there, there's some stuff. There's some dirt on Sandra. And, you know, we're going to we're going to eventually dig it up. I, I'm pretty determined. Um, so, you know, of course, they're teary in court and they're saying, if I could go back and change everything, I would. Sandra says, I love Tyler. I never meant for any of this to happen. You know, mm -hmm. whatever. You shouldn't um, try to stop it. So shush. And I mean, and the only truth was like, huh? I was going to say the only true thing that they can state is what Bryce says here. He said, I loved my son. Bryce McMillan said, I'm so sorry to all those who trusted me with his care. I failed as his father. That's true an story. Statement. True story. Uh, um, Prosecutors yeah. said they offered the plea because they did not believe the McMillans intended to kill him and that the deal was the best in the best interest of all involved in the best interest of, uh, of all alive or is, is how that works. It's not about in the best interest of, of the, the life that we lost so meaninglessly. So mm -hmm. do yourself a favor. My do yourself a favor this week is go and watch Sylvie's love on Amazon prime. It's astounding. And I think it should win all the Oscars that ever were Oscared. Have a great rest of your week or weekend, and we will see you next time. Ciao. Bye. Join the family.